Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back in again. I guess we're losing a few. It's getting a little late today. We're getting delayed, but anyhow, we're glad you're all here. And uh, for those of you joining us on television, we're just going to continue on where we left off now in our last half hour. And uh, coming out of the 16th Psalm, which is a Messianic Psalm, and we're going to pick it right up again in Acts chapter 2, where Peter quotes from the 16th Psalm concerning the resurrection of Christ. Now, you have to understand that <clears throat> resurrection was not a, a daily discussion. It certainly was evident throughout the Old Testament, but yet it was not something that was constantly referred to as we hopefully do today, because resurrection is the very core of our gospel. And as Paul says, if Christ be not raised from the dead, then you are yet in your sin. But nevertheless now, since Christ has been raised from the dead and uh, all still in association with his dealing with Israel, there has not yet been a word said about him going to the Gentile world, except as he had planned to do in the Old Testament economy was through Israel. Israel was to have been priests of Jehovah. Israel were to have been the evangelists, but they dropped the ball and lost the opportunity. But Peter yet doesn't realize that. Peter thinks this is all still part of God dealing with the nation under those covenant promises. And so now I'm going to come back where we left off in our last half hour, didn't really get the finish in Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> and let's just go back and, and repeat as we close the program. Acts chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. Therefore, did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. See, he's quoting from the Psalms. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, or as I explained in the last program, that's Hades, the place of the departed. Neither wilt I permit thy holy one to see corruption, and Christ didn't. He did not see corruption even in that three days and three nights. Now verse 28, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now then Peter comes back and he picks up his interpretation of all this. And he says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried. His sepulcher, his place of burial, is with us to this day. But now here comes the answer to it all. The next verse. Therefore, being a what? A prophet. See, now most people don't think of David as one of the prophets. We normally think of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Daniel, and all the minor prophets. But no, da David was a prophet. The Psalms have got all kinds of prophecies, but especially with regards to the death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, as I speak, I think of these things. I can't help that. That's my mode of teaching, and most of you are used to it. Keep your hand here a minute and go ahead to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, most of you already know what that says. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's gospel that has now been going out to the Gentile word, world especially, but also to the Jew. But here are some statements that I suppose a lot of people have wondered about. And now that's what made me think of it. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1, where Paul starts, Moreover, brethren, writing to fellow Gentile believers, I declare unto you the gospel, not a gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also you have received. That's why he could call them brethren. They're believers. And what you have received and wherein you stand, by which, by this gospel, you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. Now here comes the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that is, from the ascended 
glorified Lord of glory, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the what? According to the scriptures. Well, I know a lot of people, well, what's he talking about? Old Testament, see? It wasn't back there in black and white, but it was back there in what, what we'd call innuendo and just enough that now with our knowledge of the New Testament, yes, we can go back and see that God had it on his mind all along. All right, now read on. Verse 4, and that he was buried. See, we're just talking about that now in Psalm 16. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, but what? According to the scriptures. All right, now that's what we have to see. Come back with me now then to Acts chapter 2, that not only in the Psalms, but even in scriptures before Paul comes along, we have this revelation of this death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, but also as it would be passed on to every true believer. All right, back to Acts chapter 2, and then verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, one that not only spoke forth as we see it in the New Testament, but one who saw the future a thousand years. Now, he didn't understand it. There's no way that David understood a crucifixion. He didn't understand the fact that Christ was actually going to die and be, uh, have his blood shed and be placed in a tomb and all that. That was all details that were still unknown, but he certainly accepted the fact that if the suffering Savior, i got to come back to this again, that if the suffering Savior was to become a glory that would follow, there would have to be a death and a resurrection in between here is the only way it would fit. But you see, even the Jewish rabbis and scholars, they didn't figure that out. They couldn't comprehend how one person could play both roles. But see, David had an unction of it, but only as the Holy Spirit revealed it to him and how much of the details, I don't believe he understood any more than Daniel did, see? <clears throat> but reading on. Verse 30 again, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins. Now who are we talking about? David's loins. And what does that mean? The promises of this coming Messiah began with David. Now, in a latent way, yes, goes all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But when it actually came out to foretell a coming glorious kingdom and a king, it began with David. And in fact, keep your hand in Acts. Let's go back a minute again to 2 Samuel. And then that shows exactly what I'm talking about. 2 Samuel chapter 7. <clears throat> 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Oh, well, I'm in 1 Samuel. I didn't think that looked right. 2 Samuel, chapter 7. There, that looks better. <laughs> 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Let's start at verse 8. 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Drop in at verse 8. And, of course, God is dealing through the prophet Nathan. And Nathan is, in turn, going to go and speak to David. Now, therefore, God says, So shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheepcote, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them. Now, this is God speaking that Nathan is going to pass on to David. 
and that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness, that is, the Arab world around them that constantly tormented the nation of Israel, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Now you want to remember, David was successful in all of his battles, and he brought peace and prosperity to the nation as a result of all his wars. And so he says, Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also, on top of all this, looking down the eons of time, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house, a royal family. A royal family, see? And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, who shall proceed out of your innermost beings, which was Solomon. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, again a royal family, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him. Now that's speaking of the nation of Israel. And with the stripes of the children of men, but, verse 15, my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And now here it comes. And thy house, your royal family, going all the way from David clear down to Joseph and Mary, thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. All right, now then we see that laid out so clearly then in the genealogies of Matthew 1 and Luke 3. But we won't have time to look at them right now, so come back with me again to where we just were in Acts chapter 2. And so all of this began with the promises made to David of a coming king who would rule over a kingdom, of which Israel would be the primary nation, but it's going to be a world wide kingdom. All right, back to Acts chapter 2, verse 30 again. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, here a thousand years later, would come the Messiah, the Christ, to sit on David's throne. Now verse 31. He, David, Seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ. See that? A thousand years beforehand. David saw it through the eyes of prophecy and through the resurrection of Christ that his, Christ's soul was not left down there in Hades, neither did his flesh see corruption. All right, now I have to think of a verse that Paul wrote. Keep your hand in Acts. I'm not quite through the area yet, but come over with me now to Ephesians. See, we can tie all of this together. That yes, indeed, from the cross, Christ in soul and spirit went down into Hades on the paradise side, took the thief on the cross when he told him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The thief went with him. And then Peter tells us that when he got there, he preached to those Old Testament saints waiting for the release from their place in captivity because the atoning blood had now been shed. All right, now then Paul puts it this way. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Ephesians 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up, on high, he led captivity captive, those Old Testament souls that have been kept there waiting for the atoning blood, remember? He led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Now verse 9, now that he ascended, that is up to glory, what is it but that he also descended first? See, 
before he went to glory, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, into that realm of what we called Hades and Sheol, into the paradise side, and having preached to them then, he ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill or fulfill all things. All right, now, Peter is, of course, way back here yet several years previous to Paul's revelations, but he sees it clearly enough now that as David saw that the Messiah would suffer and die, he'd be resurrected back to life so that he could still yet fulfill the kingdom role of king. All right, now if you're back in Acts chapter 2 and drop down into verse 32. This Jesus, see how plain we make all this? This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. In other words, the resurrection wasn't one of those things that there wasn't evidence. There was See, a lot of things in Scripture, and I smile when mankind have a lot of problems with things. For example, Noah's Ark. My, they get all shook up. They can't find the ark. And then they get people who think they have. And then it's proven that they haven't. Well, you know, I'm sure God sits in his heaven and smiles, if I may use the expression, foolish men. Why do they want to find that ark? Well, they think then they can prove that the Bible story was true. But you know what God says? You believe it whether you see it or not. And that's faith. But see, the resurrection, he didn't do that. The resurrection, he gave ample proof. Not only did the 12 recognize it, 500 at one time saw him in his resurrected body. And then Paul says what? And last of all, me too. I saw him. But you see, there are so many things in Scripture that God makes us take it by faith. Another one is, do you realize that it's almost no archaeological evidence of Israel ever having been in Egypt. And that just drives these archaeologists up the wall, see? Well, you and I don't have to have archaeological evidence to know that they were in Egypt. We believe it. The book says it, see? But oh, then we like to read the account of how they think they found chariot wheels in the bottom of the Red Sea. Well, then that perks everybody up. Well, it must be true because there they see the chariot wheels. But beloved, we're to take this book by faith, see? But here's an example where God doesn't even leave it by faith. He left ample proof that Christ arose from the dead. All right, back to Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this. Now remember, this is Pentecost Day when the Holy Spirit came down in outright evidence of his presence. You've received of the Father the presence of the Holy Spirit. He has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Now he's back to David again. Back to the Psalms. For David is not ascended into the heavens. So goodness sakes, when the psalm says, I see him ascending into the heaven, who's it talking about? Jesus the Christ, see? All right, so David hasn't ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, David said it, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Well, we won't look at it again because we looked at it in the last program. Psalms 110.1. What did it say? The Lord said to my Lord, come sit at my right hand. And we know that the book of Hebrews confirms that. That when he had purged us from our sins, what did he do? He sat down on the right hand of the majesty at high in fulfillment of the Psalms. See? Okay, back to the Acts chapter 2, verse 35. Sit it then on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Oh, then what? 
then he's going to return and he's going to mete out vengeance and wrath and justice, which would be followed by the glory that's coming. All right, and so here again is where the Jews would get upset when Peter would make these kind of statements. And in this case, in verse 36, it was a positive response instead of like those women in Jeremiah 44. Here the Jews of Pentecost respond in verse 36, Therefore, Peter said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. He's alive, see? He can still be our promised, anointed, and our Messiah. Now, verse 37, they respond better than they did back in the Old Testament days. And what did they say? And they were convicted in their heart, and they said, Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In light of the fact that this Christ whom they had crucified and they thought was dead and out of the way was what? Alive and yet ready to bring in the kingdom. Now I'm thinking of a verse that I'm going to be using, I think, at a later taping, but let's go back and look at it. You'll have forgotten it by the time that rolls around. Come back to Psalms, I think I want 60, 68, if I'm not mistaken. Because I like to use this when people call and say, well, why did they get so upset when Stephen said, I see Jesus standing? You know those verses? When ordinarily he should have been sitting, but Stephen saw him standing? Well, what's all this got? Well, now I'm not so sure that I'm 100% right, but I think I'm close if I'm not. Psalm 68. And I think those Jews of Peter's day immediately put two and two together, or Stephen, rather, that when Stephen said, I saw Jesus standing, this psalm came to mind. And no wonder it angered them. The quicker they could kill this guy, the better, before anything worse could happen. Now read it. Psalm 68, verse 1. Let who arise? God. Well, who's sitting at the right hand of the Father? God the Son. See? And so I'm sure this is a reference that let God the Son arise. Let his enemies be what? Scattered. Oh, they didn't want to have that happen. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Was that word hate used rightly? Oh, yes, they hated him. They hated Jesus of Nazareth. Saul of Tarsus was not the only one. He was just simply the one that carried it out, see? All right, let them all that hate him flee before him. Now look at the next verse. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. And oh, they could see that it was a reference to them those who hated the name of Jesus, those who were trying to kill Stephen for standing up for Jesus of Nazareth, see? As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. You see why those Jews were all shook up when Stephen says, I see him standing? I think this says it all. All right, but now we'll say that for a later time. we still got three minutes left. Come back with me once again then to, uh, to uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 for just a moment or two that we got left. So when they heard this, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? If the one we rejected is alive... And if he is still going to bring us in the kingdom, what do we have to do to appropriate all that? And look at Peter's answer. And that's why, again, I say, this isn't church language. This isn't body of Christ language. This is Jewish language. All you have to do is stop and think, who made the very same statement at the very beginning of everything? John the Baptist. And what did he say? Repent. See? 
Repent, every one of you, and be baptized. See? That's John the Baptist's message all over. You don't believe me? Come back. Back. Back to Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Matthew, chapter 3, verse 1. And John the Baptist is just beginning his ministry. Verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, see, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what was he talking about? The king was alive. The king was in their midst. He's only a few months younger than John the Baptist, so he's already about the same age. And so here's the introduction to the whole kingdom program coming to fruition, see? For this is he that was spoken of, verse 3, by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the village, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. All right, then drop on down, verse 6. And they were baptized of him. Just exactly what Peter said. Repent and be baptized. And they were confessing their sins. And so we call it a baptism of repentance. And so the whole thing was now quickly coming to fruition. All right, now if you'll come over with me a few pages to chapter 5 in Matthew. And this will almost wind it down. <clears throat> now the Lord has begun his earthly ministry. And he's beginning to speak out. And so in chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Well, what's he going to fulfill? All these Old Testament promises concerning a king and a kingdom promised to the nation of Israel. But what was their problem? The eye, blinded eyes of unbelief. They couldn't see that any good thing would come out of Nazareth, and so they rejected him. Out of hand, we'll not have this Jesus of Nazareth rule over us. And so what happened? They crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.